Number three, challenge the desert, awakening. For the first time since the dance, Angelica clung tightly to Dylan, this time in his winged body, closer than ever before. Her heart pounded as the two swooped downwards from the tall tree and then shot up into the sky. Fl finding an updraft, Dylan began to soar gently through the morning air, and all was calm. Now that they were beyond the east edge of the evergreen forest, it was easier for Angelica to see farther along the horizon, and nearly all of Quercus Menor was visible, more so now than from the canopy of oak feather. They soared high into the air, and Angelica spotted a large city that she had never seen before, as well as the village of Anura. The entire desert, sand dunes, an oasis, vast canyons, buttes, and mesas beyond that was fully visible. Far off in the distance, she got a glimpse of what appeared to be a city etched in stone, shimmering amidst an enormous waterfall near the eastern shore. Between her and the sit that city were many other landmarks that interested her, including another staggeringly tall tree that towered over a forest much deeper than the one that they had just departed. Angelica felt a new sense of peace as she grew familiar with the scenery of her homeland. Never had she known such, a, such blissful joy as to wander the sky above the wildlands and bask in the sun while Dylan gracefully soared for hours, carrying her on his back. They stayed in the air for a long part of the day, and Angelica drew, grew increasingly accustomed to holding on tightly to Dylan's back. By the end of the day, she had become much fonder of him, and she now felt quite convinced about who it was that she desired to wed. She hoped he felt the same way, but there was no for way for her to know with certainty. Though Dylan admittedly enjoyed carrying a beautiful princess on his back, he eventually got tired of flying with all the extra weight and landed aboard the Sky Cruiser. They were just in time for dinner which Chef Pineson had prepared for them. Captain Vega approached them, saying, I thought it would take you this long to arrive. Dylan answered, Actually, we enjoyed a short scenic flight before coming here. While they ate, their conversation continued, shifting to various things that had happened during their little excursion through the forest. Before the meal was over, Angelica remembered to tell the captain about the invitation to Pistache that she, had, she and Dylan had received. The captain answered, It looks like you'll be having more time on foot then. What I've heard is that Nadra has devised an adventure for the two of you in the desert. It is just like him to invite us to talk, Dylan scoffed, only to send us to danger. I would love to explore the desert, Angelica said, that, though it seems quite hot. Vega answered, Mind you two, it's incredibly hot. You must take whatever pre precautions you can. The Sky Cruiser Prime is ready to rescue you if needed. Feeling an aversion to walking across the sand, Dylan asked, Can't we just fly there? Angelica frowned. I want to try to walk th the way there. After having walked through the forest, I already feel a lot stronger than when I left the castle and I want to experience as much as possible. Dylan answered, Sorry, I see what you mean. So be it, but we must be careful. Angelica and Dylan descended to the ground close to Pistache. The pistachio shells that sheltered the village loomed over them, unexpectedly and ominously huge. They passed between a pair of Herperasquillian statues, which emitted flame from their mouth as they stepped into the center of the dome. Of the five shells, this one seemed to be the main entrance to the village, which had built, been built mostly underground. Holding hands, they descended slowly. They slowly descended the long spiral path into the village hall. Herpo Esquirrel and statues also lit the village hall. It was more like a throne room than they had expected it to be, and Nadra sat in the center. He seemed a much different character to Angelica than before, but this new experience was more 
not experience. This new appearance was more familiar to Dylan than the way he had been in the forest. His legs were crossed comfortably, and snakes were curled close to him on either side. Dylan, Princess Angelica, welcome, he said smugly. Angelica was struck with an unexplainable sense of fear and discomfort in Nadra's presence. She was glad she had come with Dylan. I hope you found the satchel that I gave you to be useful, Nadri continued. Now that you have come, I have a proposition to make. Would you care to listen? Angelica nodded. Thank you for the satchel. We came to see what you would like us to do. She said it confidently enough, though she wasn't sure about what he would ask. I want you to visit the ruins of my tribe's ancient homeland, Nadri said. We believe that there is an ancient secret hidden in there somewhere, an artifact of sorts. I would like for you to investigate its identity. It may not be it may have it may be of immense value, so I desire that it would be brought to our city if possible. First you must find the great skull. Then you reach then you will reach the city of Carmen Fox. A chill went down Angelica's spine. She and Dylan nodded to each other. Climb the staircase on the left, Nadri reminded them. It leads to the town marketplace. There, you will. What you will, what you need will be provi- provided for you. The two of them bowed lightly to Nadri, and made their way up the staircase towards the marketplace. It was a straight, direct path to follow, unlike the curved spiral pathway they had taken to the village hall. When they arrived, Angelica walked over to the closest shop. She asked the owner whether they had a pack for carrying supplies. Here you are, the shopkeeper said. There is a tarp included with this, which you can use as a tent. Angelica said, told Dylan, we should get some protective clothing for the heat and sand, as well as some food and drink to take into the desert. I'll go find the food and drink, Dylan agreed. The merchant across the way should have robes and headpieces. Would you get an outfit for each of us? Angelica thanked the shopkeeper and stepped over to the stall opposite and asked for some desert clothes. When Dylan returned with the food and drink, they found a place to change into their clothing and packed the backpack. They were ready to step out onto the sands east of Pistache. It became painfully clear why the desert was known as the Burning Sands. Despite their protective clothing, an overwhelming wave of searing heat from the sun instantly came over them, nearly knocking them off their feet. Neither was accustomed to the scorching sensation of or feeling of the countless particles of sand that came from walking in the desert. They wavered in the heat. Dylan said, I'm glad we put our outfits on before we got outside. I can't believe the difference in temperature in such a short distance. We'll have a difficult passage. Just behind them were the coolly shaded trees of the evergreen forest. Yet an endless landscape of sand spread spread before them as far as the eye could see, and the only sign of life was the occasional cactus. Once they had accustomed themselves to the burning heat of the desert, they began to walk, but their energy depleted hastily nonetheless. Dylan wasn't even sure if he could take flight in this heat. Either way, Angelica had expressed a desire to walk, and Dylan decided to join her on foot, so that they could stay together. The sands seared the pads of their feet while they pressed on through the heat for quite some time, but eventually found themselves near a towering dune. When they stepped into its shade, they realized that their side of the hill must have never had any direct sunlight, because it was surprisingly cold. The change in temperature should have been relieving for them, but it was too abrupt. Instead of helping, it caused them to lose their footing and collapse. Here, they rested for the first time since they had entered the desert earlier that day. It was difficult to tell what time of the day it was, because the sun was entirely invisible behind the towering dune, They cast a shadow over them. But Angelica was hungry. She said, I think we have something, we should have something to eat before we try to go on. 
they ate some dried apple, which they had brought with them, and drank some water. Then they pitched tent using the tarp that they had received, because they now realized it would be wise to travel during the night time rather than the day. Angelica was growing accustomed to sleeping together with Dylan in close range, but in the small enclosed space, it was still a breathtaking experience. Bone-chilling cold forced them to awake and realize the night had fallen. They packed the tent and began to trek their way, trek up toward the top of the dune. Angelica's lungs hurt from the freezing air, and the shifting sand made the climb difficult. But she tried to not get to do. <laughs> she tried not to get discouraged. Although every time she looked up, the top was so distant she couldn't see it. <laughs> Dylan and Angelica only barely made it to the top by sunrise. They decided to sleep through the following day because behind the apex of the dune, which was decidedly large enough to be described as a mountain. There was no comparable shaded place in sight when they finally passed the summit. When they awoke that night, they hurried frantically across the sand, hoping to reach some shaded ground before daybreak. Unfortunately, they never made it to any shade, but they needed to find some before they could rest again. They pushed on through the day, neglecting to stop at all for food and drink, but their negligence was unwise, and soon began to take its toll. As the sun rose into the sky, and the heat grew with it, Angelica suddenly stopped to rub her eyes. She exclaimed, Dylan, look, it's an oasis. Let's run to it. Dylan had not been quite as affected by the sunlight as Angelica. He only saw before them an endless sea of sand, shimmering with heat far off in the horizon, and he knew what she had seen. He hurried to stop her and gave her his flask, telling her, I'm sorry, Angelica, there is no oasis. What you saw was a mirage. Please drink this. Angelica and Dylan both took a moment to fill up on water and eat a small portion of food to avoid repeating the same dangerous mistake. They decided to hold a fixed meal schedule as they trud trudged towards their goal. Eventually, night fell, and Angelica and Dylan finally got some rest. They could not move on through the night as they had planned because they had not found any other shaded dunes comparable to the one that they, where they had rested on their way into the desert. Nor had they found another cover that would make it possible for them to sleep during the day. Dylan made an effort to ensure that they would wake early the next day. When they awoke, they walked hastily to onwards to make enough progress before the blistering heat of the sun overtook them. This time, they remembered to take sips of water and chew a bit of dried bovidon meat every so often to keep from wearing themselves out during their course towards the ruins. They came at last to the top of the next dune, where they could see the horned skull. It supposedly indicated the location of the ancient Herpoes girl and civilization that Nadra had asked them to visit. Angelica vaguely remembered seeing the same skull from high in the sky when she rode on Dylan's back the other day. It hadn't occurred to her then, but now it was clear that such a magnificent beast couldn't have been from Quercus Menorah. As far as she knew, the largest of the animals that lived in this land were only about the size of an agrifol about twice the size of an agrifolian squirrel. What creature could this skull belong to? Angelica asked Dylan, as if he knew the answer. I don't know, but now that we know where our desti but now we know where our destination is. Dylan replied. Imagine if our heading had been even marginally north or south of here, we would have missed it. I see no ruins. Could it be that the city was underground, or have we been fooled? Dylan's distrust in Nadre did seem understandable. I want to keep reading this, but I, I'm running out of time, so I'll ca catch up from this uh, next page uh, next time I have a chance to record. Thank you for listening. You can find the book on Amazon if you search Quercus Menorah, or if you 
just click on the link in the description. Thank you.